Freedom of speech. Fundamental rights. Freedom of uh, conscience. Academic freedom. Freedom of press. And the right to listen. You're listening to So to Speak, the free speech podcast brought to you by FIRE, the foundation for individual rights in education. At long last, welcome back to So to Speak, the free speech podcast, where usually every other week we take uncensored looks at the world of free expression through personal stories and candid conversations. I am your host, Nico Perino, and I want to apologize to all of you for the show's month-long hiatus. This past month and a half or so saw kind of the perfect storm of events conspiring to prevent me from producing the show. For one, I got married at the end of July and then embarked on my honeymoon, so I was out of the office for more or less two weeks. But more significantly, I've been engrossed in two projects that have been in the works for years, and we are racing to the finish line to complete and share them with you all. One of those projects is still secret, but it should be announced on or around September 22nd, so stay tuned for that. The other project I've briefly alluded to on the show before, and it's the one that I've been working on since 2018 with my fire colleagues Aaron Reese and Chris Maltby. We've been preparing a feature-length documentary about the life and career of former ACLU Executive Director Ira Glasser. He ran the ACLU from 1978 to 2001, Ira's been on the show before, way back in 2017, and it was that interview that inspired us to put some of his war stories to film. We largely focus in the film on his free speech work, on First Amendment issues, but the film goes beyond that to cover his childhood growing up in Brooklyn and seeing Jackie Robinson break the color barrier. We look at the deaths of Martin Luther King Jr. and Bobby Kennedy and how those impacted Ira's lives. Uh, But we also look at Ira's friendship with William F. Buckley Jr. and much, much more. So the film is called Mighty Ira, and the trailer is now out and available on the movie's website, MightyIra.com. And I'll also link the trailer in the show notes here. The film, for those of you who want to see it, will premiere in a virtual theatrical format via Angelica Film Center's website on October 9th. Angelica is an indie movie theater chain uh, throughout the United States. Uh, But it will be available on wider streaming platforms and DVD and Blu-ray in the weeks following. I'll keep you updated on this show, uh, and you'll also be able to follow the updates on social media or at MightyIra.com, and those updates will be more contemporaneous than our every other week, so to speak, episode. So today's guest is actually heavily featured in Mighty Ira. His name is David Goldberger, and he was the lead attorney in the 1977 case that has simply become known as the Skokie case. It's come to epitomize what the First Amendment means in America. David, as most of you should know, represented the Chicago-based National Socialist Party of America and its neo-Nazi leader, Frank Collin, after that group was denied the right to rally in Skokie, Illinois, outside of City Hall. Skokie was home at the time to a large number of Holocaust survivors. David won the case, but as you can guess, not without a lot of controversy along the way, which we'll discuss But we'll also discuss the rest of David's storied legal career, including his four Supreme Court cases, all of which he won, I should say, and two of which he argued. So now let's get on to the show. David Goldberger, welcome out of the show. Well, thank you. Good to be with you. So I want to start by asking you, what led you to a career in the law? Was that something you were always interested in? I started college with a, uh, a commitment to go into the foreign service, of all things. I'd been a high school exchange student, and I got to graduate school. My dad had been telling me in the meantime, get a law degree, get a law degree. He was very traditional, and his view was, no matter what it is, nobody can take it away from you. You can always make a living. And I got off to uh, graduate school in international affairs. And I started to look at the people around me that were going to go to into the foreign service. And I said, I'm not like these guys at all. This is, I'm not going to, this isn't going to work. And then I started to think about the things I could do with a law degree. And it all focused on public service and law reform. And I started to get really excited about it. And, uh, I went to law school. Where, where'd you grow up? I was born on the North side of Chicago in the Rogers Park area, Mm -hmm. and we moved to the south suburbs, a place called Park Forest. Oh, I'm familiar. I I grew up in Elmhurst. Oh, so you know a little (laughs) bit about it. Well, when I was there, 
it was very, very conservative, six to one in terms of, if, you know, six Republicans for every Democrat, I was told. So I was, from the outset, I was kind of pushing against the current, you know, and from there I went off to, school, to college. And where'd you go? To, where'd you do your undergrad work? I started at the University of Illinois, but after a year, I transferred to the University of Chicago. And again, those were political times. It was the Vietnam War and reform and protest was in the air. Were, were you a activist? Would you? Is that how you describe yourself? Did you oppose the Vietnam War? And I was publicly? opposed to it, but I wasn't very active in my opposition because at that point, I just was working my tail off on my studies and was very, very reluctant to take time out to uh, do anything except work toward my, uh, my degree. So it really wasn't until after I got out of law school and uh, got my first job at the ACLU that um, I became an activist. And why the University of Chicago Law School? Did your undergrad work there, some of it? Was it just the easiest transition, or was there something particular about the school that drew you to it? Well, mostly had to do with the fact that I was in the college, and I knew the law school was good, but I had no idea at the time that its tradition was very libertarian, kind of Chicago school economics, at least at the time of Milton Friedman was on the faculty. So I did, I really had no sense of the kind of orientation that it had. So I went there because it seemed to make sense and I was accepted. I w really wasn't very strategic about it at that point. And that was the law school? Yes. When you were in law school, did you know what type of law you want to practice? I hear from, you know, aspiring attorneys all the time that they don't really know what they want to practice when no. they get to law school. And it's it's kind of after law school or at the tail end of law school that they decide. Well, Few are the students who know as soon as they go in. Were you one of those? Well, uh, probably uh, somewhere in between. I knew that I was not going to go into private practice. I was going to go either into the public defender's office or find a job where I was involved in public service someplace. It was, I had no interest in um, the traditional private practice so that I can't say that I knew I wanted to work in the First Amendment or civil liberties area because I had no idea what my options were, but I knew what I didn't want to do, and that was private practice. How do you get to the ACLU then? Was that your first job out of college at the Illinois affiliate? It was, um, talk about dumb luck. <laughs> I, I had started in a, I had enrolled in a program called VISTA, which was um, a government program that put, you know, provided lawyers in the, for the community and legal services and so forth. And while I was, I was in the training session and I was riding to work with uh, a woman that was a year behind me who knew my politics and my orientation and she told me about this opening at the ACLU and at the time I thought that was pretty radical stuff <laughs> and uh, but I was excited about it so I went and applied and I ended up getting the job and the rest is kind of history. Tell me a little bit you said you thought the ACLU was radical stuff what did you know about the American Civil Liberties Union before you applied? Fairly little I, I knew that they were doing um, civil rights work and civil liberties work. As I just told you, I had come out of a very conservative community, and I was very sensitive to the uh, the McCarthy, Army McCarthy and McCarthyite shenanigans in Congress. So I was feeling very cautious about what kind of an organization I wanted to get involved in. I did absolutely did not want to be in a position where I was working with an organization where for some reason or another I could get blacklisted as I want at moving laterally from one job to another. I had a sense that the ACLU was not going to put me in a position where I was going to be accused of being anything but a libertarian or, or a civil libertarian. 
So uh, I moved to it pretty easily. I knew it's First Amendment work, and that's what really excited me about it. When you arrived at the Illinois Division of the ACLU, how big was it? What were your first impressions? It was it was comparatively small. I think there were maybe a half dozen of us on the staff. There were two lawyers, an executive director, a fundraiser, that's four, an office manager, five, and then um, there was another woman that I think she was a utility infielder, so to speak, and that was uh, six. So it was really small. And did you come on as a staff attorney or were you, you eventually became legal director? Right. Um, I came on as a staff attorney. I didn't know my, select my words carefully, I didn't know my, didn't know my, you know what, from my elbow. I mean, I really did not. Legal education for me was uh, sitting in a classroom and taking notes and taking exams or writing papers. I'd never had any training in trial practice. I did not know how to try a case. So I was not um, in a position, I felt, to do any kind of leading. I wanted to go to a place where I was going to learn how to do it. Is that still kind of the case as an aside? No. With legal education? I, I no. didn't go to law school, so no. I, I don't know. Now, I mean, there was a clinic there, but it was uh, when I was at, at the law school, but it was not something that every law student took. And um, there was not much stress on learning how to try a case or anything like that. Now it's not so much the case. I think that there are the clinics do terrific work around the country. They represent all kinds of clients. Uh, many of them do a very important law reform work so that students, I think, come out of law school with a much better or much more rounded education than they did when I came out. What were the most common kinds of cases you saw at the Illinois affiliate? Well, it's kind of hard to say what were the most common kinds of cases. It was whatever really emerged in the papers or clients walking through the door. So there was a little of everything going on. There were First Amendment cases. There were misdemeanor cases. There were, you know, due process cases. You know, when I talk about misdemeanor cases, you, you prosecuted either for demonstrating and getting charged with disorderly conduct or somebody, you know, we had a client that uh, was kind of forced to plead guilty when it was clear that he was uh, incompetent to stand trial, but it, and it was a misdemeanor. I had a long hair case. Kids, boys were being thrown out of school for letting their hair grow too long and touching their collars. A woman that was thrown out of school because she got pregnant and uh, the school policy is if you're pregnant, you're not allowed to complete your education. So that it was a little bit of this and a little bit of that up until the Vietnam protests really became intense because I started in 1967 and the national mobilization against the war in Vietnam started a year or two or three after I got there. And that's when I really started to zero in on First Amendment work because they were in there seeking permits, uh, needing to uh, negotiate parade routes and so forth. And I was the point man, it just by chance, but it was a very challenging and an exciting time. So it was just a little bit of this and a little bit of that until the war in Vietnam really uh, forced a focus on First Amendment. Before you actually got involved in the First Amendment work, what was your conception of the First Amendment, in particular the, the free speech and assembly clauses? Or did you kind of really cut your teeth on what First Amendment philosophy was doing it. I guess it's a long way of asking, did you think critically about the First Amendment protections before you were actually involved in the casework? Uh, no, I probably didn't think as critically as one would assume. I understood from my, my classwork and the, you know, my you know, the law school work, I had First Amendment cases. Uh, I didn't take a First Amendment course. I took a course on libel. But the First Amendment was a significant part of my constitutional law 
training. So I had a sense of the First Amendment. And at home, uh, my dad, who was a businessman, had an instinct for these kinds of issues and was always talking about the right to people to exercise their rights, particularly when they wanted to advocate a position. But I really did not get into the depth of it, really, until I began to litigate against the city of Chicago when it was blocking, tried to block, uh, the anti-war demonstrators from using public forums. It tried to block the National Socialist Party from using Chicago parks. It was then I was in the crucible and, and it was learning by doing, which was probably the whole uh, early part of my career. You mentioned the National Socialist Party. So I think now is probably a good time to get into a little bit of the Skokie case, which represented, I'm assuming, a definitive moment or time in your career. Frank Collin was the leader of the National Socialist Party of America. And one day he gave you a call, right? Yes. But let me walk you back a step. He was a client on two or three cases that nobody ever heard of before Skokie. And that's how he knew to give us a call. He had a punch card with you all. Well, it wasn't. We were the only place in town that would, you know, stand up for him and his group. And when, and whatever was going on, whatever the ideas were, each of the times he walked into the office and asked for help, he came in with a pristine First Amendment case, no questions about violence, no questions about misrepresentation of the facts or anything like that. It was a straight up classic First Amendment case. I mean, he was in that sense a little like the Jehovah's Witnesses in the 40s who um, were out on the streets saying horrific things about the Catholic Church and getting arrested. But each time they got arrested, it was a pristine First Amendment case. And and, uh, there he was. I mean, he had the uncanny ability to figure out how best, and this was without our coaching, how best to raise the issues so that he could maximize his opportunities to use public places to speak. And to be clear, he was a neo-Nazi, correct? Correct. His group would rally wearing Nazi uniforms with uh, Nazi, the the swastika insignia on on their arms. Absolutely. And his speeches were racist in the parks where he gave them. And the signs, uh, either he had one huge swastika banner that would appear at each of the uh, marches and lots of signs that, or several signs, it depends. The group wasn't that big. I mean, I figure there were 25 to 50 regulars. And then when he marched in the area of his headquarters on the southwest side of Chicago, then there'd be people from the community that would join the march. A lot of people don't understand the context. And I was one of those until I sat down to learn more about it. But Skokie didn't begin in the suburb of Skokie. It began in Chicago, right? When Frank Collin was prevented from not only marching or rallying in the Southwest side, but in any public park in Chicago, he came to you and and there was a big debate controversy in Chicago at the time about desegregating the schools and uh, gentrification and white flight. And Frank Collin didn't like that uh, white communities were fleeing for the suburbs. I, as a general statement, what you've said is accurate. More precisely, he had a headquarters building that he apparently owned on the southwest side of Chicago in Marquette Park. And to the east of Marquette Park was a black community. And folks from that community were starting to try to buy houses in Marquette Park, which was white. And as I recall, a very significant percentage were Lithuanians. And there was a panic. And he basically began to proselytize that saved the community from integration and from white flight just by, you know, his rallies. So that that's how things started. And the reaction of the city of Chicago was to to refuse permits to the local park, which was near his headquarters, Marquette Park. And then when he tried to 
And that was one case, or there were a couple of cases. And then there was another case in which went to the Court of Appeals in which they, um, realizing that he was going to be a regular, or try to be a regular customer, uh, he tried to get a permit to go up to the north side of Chicago at Lincoln Park. And what they did was they said, well, you can come, but only if you use our designated sites for your assembly. And of course, the sites were not ones that he wanted. And so we, that was the first really important case that we litigated for him, challenging the authority of the uh, Chicago Park District to take a public forum and say, well, you can't use these areas. These are for picnics and these are for families and these are for baseball. You have to use these sites over here on the edge that we give you permission to use. And it was through that series of cases that we became um, familiar with him and uh, the issues that he raised. As his lawyer, you have a Jewish background. Did Frank find it difficult to work with you or did you find it difficult to work with Frank? Frank was a client and my attitude was that it was no different than me representing someone accused of a felony. Uh, yes, it was uncomfortable, but my attitude was that it was the job of a lawyer to put away feelings of disdain for a client and to roll up one's sleeves and get the job done. So that, uh, and I want to add to that, as I worked with him, I began to understand that whatever his agenda was and whatever he did on the streets his answers to me were always accurate. He didn't lie to me about what he was planning to do with the assembly or at the assembly he was trying to get the permit for. So I could trust what I was dealing with. And it was a relationship, therefore, that was defined as an attorney-client relationship addressing a particular issue. So I was you could always have your sense of... Um, separation from your client, and you could keep your feelings under control. Do you think that's still an ethos that motivates a lot of young lawyers today? I know you've been out of teaching for a long time, but uh, at least in my generation, you know, I'm 30, I find it harder for people to separate the principle from the work or the beliefs of those uh, whose rights they're defending. Uh, and you, you see this in, in other aspects of our culture as well. For example, you can't look at some artists or watch their films if they have a background that might be seen to be deplorable or unsavory in certain aspects. I think the issue of the arts, that's a whole, that's a, that's another can of worms. We may get to it. We may not, but it's a long-standing question, too. Yeah. It's, that one's not a new one. Yeah, but th this but, question of neutral principles, I guess. No, abs it, well, it's not so much the neutral principles that that I've seen shift and the attitude toward neutral principles. There are, for example, I think the public defenders and criminal defense lawyers are still hewing the line. They're doing what they're supposed to be doing, and they're not turning their noses in, up in the air and saying, "I won't touch that case." Uh, I have a op professional obligation to do it, and I'm going to get the job done, win, lose, or draw. And, and to present the question kind of squarely with an example, Ronald Sullivan, who's a high-profile criminal defense attorney, uh, professor at Harvard, black professor at Harvard, uh, leads led one of the residential houses there. Right. He joined Harvey Weinstein's legal defense team and was essentially driven out from the residential house, people thinking that it was unsafe to live right, right. in the same environment with a man who was on the legal defense team for someone accused of sexual assault. I absolutely think that, you know, I'm, I watched the Sullivan case with some disappointment. I was particularly disappointed with Harvard in the way it addressed the thing and what the results were. So as far as I was concerned, Sullivan was doing what lawyers do. And you could say, well, he could get another lawyer. And that may be the case in that case, because there was so much money involved that uh, Weinstein could always get another lawyer. But that's certainly no reason to criticize a lawyer who takes the case. Lawyers 
do that all the time. Uh, Skokie, it was an easier case from my point of view because there was no other lawyer that could represent the Nazis. And if we didn't step up, their rights would not be vindicated. So, and that to me was completely unacceptable. But to go back to your first question, my view is that first of all, we have to keep separate the reaction of non-lawyers and you know the non-lawyer students at um, at Harvard, for example, is a disappointment and is wrong. And there needs to be some education, although there's so much po- polarization and watching. Uh, the intolerance of the progressive left right now, uh, which parallels the intolerance of the the far right in this country. Um, There is the tendency of of lawyers who I think 30 or 40 years ago would have been more willing to step up to hard cases. Now there's a tendency of the lawyers, and I think this is true at the ACLU, which is a bother, a bother, it's a disappointment. Um, that the lawyers tend to identify with their clients, as a, which is not, in my view, professional. And once they identify with the clients, it means that, uh, and they feel that they should identify with the clients, it means that they're not going to be able to represent pe- people who they don't identify with. And that's a terrible criteria for representing someone or standing up for a principal. The Skokie case, the facts of it, have been played out and retold in countless places, including uh, the forthcoming documentary that you appear in, uh, that we're putting out. But I want to, you know, the, the fact that you had a large group of Holocaust survivors, Frank Collin and his band of neo-Nazis wanted to rally in front of City Hall and were denied, and the Holocaust survivors and the larger Jewish community in Skokie revolted against uh, the efforts of Frank Collin to come and, and your effort and the ACLU efforts to vindicate his rights. But I want to ask you about your particular journey within that case. It became a national phenomenon. What did you experience? I've read that you've received hate mail, death threats. Uh, the Jewish Defense League even came to your office. Can you tell talk about the challenges that you faced during that time? Well, To start, remember I said I'd represented him a couple of times prior to his asking for representation in Skokie. So it had been reported in the newspapers, but nobody thought a lot about it. There was a friendly editorial in the Chicago Tribune once saying that we were doing what we should be doing in a First Amendment set of cases. So uh, when he asked for representation, I really did not understand how explosive the Skokie case was going to become. Um, And it was not until when I discussed it with my general counsel, a very wise old man, loved him, uh, named Ed Rothschild. And he said, David, he listened to what was going on. And it was a classic First Amendment case, a classic ACLU case. He said, David, I order you to take the case. And I said, Ed, what are you saying? I have the authority and the staff has the authority to take the case because it's clearly within policy. What, what are you, you know, what's this ordering? Never done that before. He said, David, you have no idea what's coming. He said, and when they come after you, they're going to have to come after me too. <laughs> and that's when I began to get an idea that this was a much more explosive case than I ever imagined. One of the most explosive appearances or interviews that I've seen you do about the case was on the Phil Donahue show. I was able to track down for this documentary the full segment, which isn't available anywhere else online, uh, and watched the whole thing. And Phil Donahue packed the audience with Holocaust survivors from Skokie. It's just you and Phil having a conversation. And then he opens up these audience members, some of whom are rolling up their sleeves showing you their tattoos. Talk about that experience. Did, did you know they were going to be there? No, I had no idea what was coming. I didn't even know who Phil Donahue was. I thought he was a local talk show host. And I was in the uh, studio 
shortly before the, I mean, he called and he said, would you appear on the show? And I said, you know, our attitude was, and particularly the executive director, I said, whenever you're asked to explain your work as part of our duty as educators to educate people about civil liberties. So you go and you respond and you respond quickly. So I got the call and I said, of course, I'll do it. He then asked me if I do it with Colin. And I said, no. I said, if you want to interview Frank Colin, feel free. But um, I'm his lawyer. And if we are there together, I think people will confuse me with his cause. And I'm, that's just not uh, something I'm up for. So I showed up at the studio, and then I said naively about how big do you think your audience is? I was expecting him to say, oh, several hundred thousand. And he said, well, and this was big at the time. I do not know whether it's big anymore, but he says about five million. And at, at that point, I said, oh, my God, what am I in for? <laughs> um, and then we went out, and I, again, he said, well, I have a few people in the audience from Skokie who may want to ask some questions. I said, fine. Well, I recognized some of them when questions started back and forth because I'd had contact with some of them, and I knew how irate they were. I did not expect survivors. I absolutely did not expect the kind of heated exchange that emerged. He'll be the first one to be shot. Uh, by, by the, the, by the, the Nazis, but these ideas. I, I expected, this, a, you know, you kind of a quiet now. conversation uh, 10 o'clock in the morning on a, you know, on a weekday. So it was, uh, it was a baptism under fire, is all I can tell you. Than the uncivilized, and that things have turned upside down because of people like you. Speaking to Holocaust survivors about the case, did you do a lot of it. I mean, you obviously did some of it uh, during the Phil Donahue show. Did you find it difficult? I've never examined those feelings because it was my responsibility to talk and explain and make clear what was going on. It made me uneasy and uncomfortable, but um, my view is, was that if I could explain what I was doing, perhaps they would understand even if they wouldn't agree so that um, I went out of my way to make myself available any time that I knew that people from Skokie, including survivors, were going to be in the audience. And I went up to Skokie on occasion, and I did speaking engagements all over the north side and the north shore of Chicago, where, where the Jewish community was concentrated. Frank Collin uh, eventually won his right to rally in Skokie. He never did. He ended up winning the right to rally in the city of Chicago, um, both in the city proper and then also on the southwest side in Marquette Park, which is kind of where everything began. But that first time he returned to Chicago, I read somewhere that you had moved your family away, uh, not permanently, but you left because you feared there would be violence. No, this was just on the day of the assembly. I got them out. We owned a house on the south side of Chicago, and I figured that the best thing for me to do was to get out of um, the house in case there was any either picketing or anybody threw stones at the house or anything like that. So it was just for about 24 to 48 hours we, we were out of the house. You eventually moved to Columbus, Ohio, to teach at the Ohio State uh, <laughs> Law School. That always cracks me up. How did that opportunity come up? I mean, what year did you go over there? Skokie ran from 77 to 79. And after we won in the Illinois Supreme Court and after the assembly, and the assembly wasn't held in Skokie, as you pointed out, but uh, due to some ne negotiations and Collins' real agenda, which was to get into the Chicago parks, Skokie wasn't, I think, his ultimate goal. It was a peripheral, secondary goal, which he was forced to by the, the closing of the Chicago parks. In any case, um, 
his demonstration was moved to downtown Chicago. After it occurred, and it was successful, there was a minimum of arrests, almost no violence to speak of. Uh, I started to say, maybe, you know, I've been in this job for a good while. I been, had been teaching at uh, Chicago Kent Law School as an adjunct, and I liked it. And I said, why not do it full time? It's, you know, it's kind of like once I'd been through Skokie, I, I to, frankly, I, I was, it was time for a change. I mean, the, the case had really taken a lot out of me, much more out of me than I really understood. And I liked teaching, so, uh, and I applied to schools around the country and interviewed at Ohio State and got the job. While you were at Ohio State, uh, you didn't stop litigating. No. If my research is correct, there were three subsequent Supreme Court cases you were involved in, those just Supreme right. Court cases, right. uh, two of which you you argued. I want to talk a little bit about those cases. Were they done as part of a clinic at Ohio State, or was this... Yeah, my case, lo my course load at Ohio State was I taught a, a constitutional law course. This is throughout my career at Ohio State, which ran for 29 years. I taught con law, the First Amendment, and I taught in the clinic and became the director of the clinic, ultimately. And so I continued to litigate law reform cases where I could in light of all the other things that were going on. So the cases that I litigated that you refer to were clinic cases, and I did them. And in conjunction, the ones that went to the Supreme Court, the ACLU was uh, also uh, involved institutionally. I was lead counsel. They signed on as, uh, inst for, as institutional support. You kind of continued the theme of representing individuals at the periphery of American society in some of those cases. Right. Uh, and Cutter v. Wilkinson, I believe it was Satanists who Well, were, it was, uh, this is 2005. Right. The most right. recent one. The clients were, there were three different religions, Satanists, Asatru, and um, the third one will come to me probably after we're done with the interview, but <laughs> they were the, the three lead clients. The most visible and the most active client were the Asatru clients. And what's Asatru? I, I'm not familiar. They were essentially worshippers of Thor and the gods of Northern Europe. Vikings. <laughs> That's right, except for the fact that they were being blocked because the Department of Corrections saw them as white nationalists and felt that therefore they were part of the um, you know white inmate culture that would be potentially violent. So they wanted to make sure that they couldn't get together for groups uh, worship and they could not have uh, permission to engage in any kind of worship at all. As far as the um, the department was concerned, they threatened the safety and the well-being of the uh, department's institutions. You argued that case. Did did you win that case or lose right. that case? It was confusing to me. No, we won. It, we won that case. That case was. It turned out that about the time that I undertook the representation in that case. It started as a free exercise case because the, the clients, in, in a certain sense like Colin, were identifiable as racists, I suppose, but the bottom line is that the religious activity that they wanted to engage in was peaceable and fit well within the regulations of the department in terms of you know the kinds of activities that other religions engaged in, so that there was absolutely no evidence of gang activity, which is what the department said they, they were concerned about. And so the department was saying, you can't do it. So about six months after I got involved, Congress passed a law because the Department of Corrections had been blocking worship of all kinds of groups, including fundamentalist Christian groups. And Congress passed a law called the Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act, which required departments of corrections to accommodate the religious worship of the inmates. 
if they were going to get federal money. And the state of Ohio challenged the constitutionality of that law. And that's uh, what went up to the Supreme Court as to whether that was a constitutional, whether it was a constitutional law, whether it was consistent with uh, the Establishment Clause. The other case you argued was in 1995. You had two cases in 1995 at the Supreme Court, one of which you argued, one of which, if I'm correct, you were co-counsel on. Right. Uh, But the one you argued was a campaign finance case. It was a campaign regulation case that was about whether or not a person who was leafleting to oppose a school levy and handing out leaflets without her name on it could be fined because the Illinois, I beg your pardon, the Ohio legislature had passed a law requiring that the individuals always had to identify themselves on their campaign leaflets and on their campaign materials. And you won that case. Correct. I mean, a lot of people don't think of uh, campaign regulations as involving this sort of activity, you know, just a concerned citizen handing out leaflets uh, in opposition to a proposed school tax levy. But right. often they are applied to your average citizen, your neighbor, yeah, that's who's exactly. engaged in the acti- activity. And, and it's done unknowing to them. And often it's these regulations are applied inconsistently and only when there's someone who has an axe to grind with the underlying speech or activity. Margaret McIntyre, the client, I, I don't think I, politically I would have could agree on lunch with her, you know, if you well, that's you and a lot of your clients, it seems yeah, like, David. <laughs> but, but she, I mean, again, it was clean as a whistle because she was outside a uh, school board meeting handing out her leaflets. And there had been past tax levies that had failed in that community. And she was part of a, an anti-tax group there in the community. So the school district just hated her. So here was an opportunity, because she was a gadfly, she was a community gadfly, here was an opportunity to sting her. And so they went after her, and the uh, Ohio Election Commission brought in and went after her, and she was fined. The other case, and you were 4-0 at the Supreme Court, if you include uh, the Skokie case, which went up there for review in kind of a quick and dirty fashion, but the the other case was Capitol Square Review and Advisory Board v. Panetti. If that, I'm pronouncing that last Panetta. name correctly. Yeah. Panetta. Vince Panetta, right. And this involved uh, the right of the Ku Klux Klan to place an unattended cross on the Ohio State House Plaza uh, near a privately sponsored menorah during the holiday season. Now, right. that's, I mean, that's, that's a very visceral image uh, for a lot of people. Uh, the review board denied the application for them to erect the cross. But if we're committed to viewpoint neutrality, allowing the menorah to go up and not the cross uh, would seem to me to be viewpoint discrimination. Absolutely. And, and the, I mean, it wasn't like they were going to be juxtaposed to one another, but they weren't going to be all that far apart, I would imagine, 50 or 100 feet apart. But the uh, one of the things that kind of... Sh- me during the case, although the argument was abandoned in the Supreme Court, when I asked the attorney general, or I beg your pardon, I guess the state solicitor at that point, how you could have the menorah without allowing the cross. And his response was, well, the menorah is not as holy as the cross. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I mean, what do you say to that? I, as a Jew, was offended. Yeah. And I told him, I mean, you know, are you going to tell me my symbol's not as worthy of uh, respect as the uh, the Latin cross? Give me a break. Fortunately, they did not make, he was not the same uh, attorney that argued the case in the U.S. Supreme Court. Ultimately, they did not make that argument in the Supreme Court. I did not think it was going to fly. Yeah, presumably you could <laughs> you could ban cross burnings, or as the Klan likes to call them, cross illuminations on the property. But the the mere image, to the extent that you ban, you know, open flames and whatnot. Right, right. And this was just this was just. I mean, as far as the public was concerned, it was a cross. They didn't, you know, there was no 
Um, there, there were, there was no, in fact, the only thing that connected it to the clan was the fact that there was a disclaimer added to the bottom of the, you know, from the litigation that this is not a, in fact, I don't think it referred to the clan. It just said, this is not the property of the state, nor does the state uh, have anything to do with the uh, message here. The, the nineties were quite a time for uh, clan cross cases. I mean, there was Virginia v. Black, and I believe RAV was also right. a uh, clan cross case, all of which I believe the ACLU was involved in in one way or another. Yes, and that's a worry because I, hopefully they, they will show up when the time comes. I, they, I think the national legal director understands their responsibility in these kinds of cases. Yeah, David is a... A very strong First Amendment guy. I actually watched the documentary about the ACLU's uh, Trump cases uh, called The Fight recently came out, uh, and they talked a little bit about Skokie. And there were a number of people who were arguing against the ACLU's position in the Skokie case, but David stayed pretty strong on it. I don't know if he's fighting a lonely battle or not, but uh, in my experience, David has been a very strong uh, free speech First Amendment advocate. Yeah, well, because some of the younger people on the ACLU staff are not so inclined. The the Supreme Court cases, what's it like to argue in front of the Supreme Court? <laughs> Intimidating. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, you know, th- there are lawyers who um, kind of practice with a swagger and with a sense of absolute self-confidence. I'm not one of them. Uh, and so... Arguing before the Supreme Court, you know that it's going to be, um, these are people that are smarter than you are or as smart, and, and at the very least, uh, the justices have read the papers, and they've had law clerks also help prepare them, So, uh, and they have positions, and so they're going to use the questions that, and you know this ahead of time, they're going to use the questions they ask you to, to make their position clear to justices that they think don't agree with them or that they want to bring along to their side. And you also know, which is something that's not, I don't know if they still do it, but I know they did it uh, when I argued my last case. It was rumored that they would take a vote on who made the best argument of the day <laughs> when they were back in ch- chambers. So. You knew that it was um, like a law school examination, and those aren't fun. I want to close out. You used the word earlier in the conversation, civil libertarian. And, uh, you know, I'm younger, like I said, 30 years old, doing similar work, albeit in a smaller domain that is higher education. And some of my heroes, when I first started doing this work about a decade ago, uh, were the old school civil libertarians. I attended Nat Hentoff's funeral in 2017 and uh, Norman Siegel and Ira Glasser, I didn't know them at the time, I hadn't even heard their names before, came up to me or introduced to me uh, and they said, oh, you're at fire, you do what we used to do. And I said, okay, well, who are you and what did you used to do? <laughs> and they explained it to me. And subsequently, I invited Ira to come on the same podcast. He had retired in 2001 as executive director of the ACLU and told me when I invited him on the show that he might not remember much. And anyone who's ever spoken to Ira knows uh, that- He remembers everything. Three hours later, we hadn't (laughs) even uh, reached the tip of the iceberg. He remembered everything. That man, you know, he's 82 years old now or or something, and he's got a steel trap mine. Yeah, he's amazing. But- Nat Hentoff, you know, Ira Glasser, Norman Siegel, Arye Nyer, uh, David Goldberger. Uh, you know, these were, are my heroes when I started this work. Old school civil libertarians, uh, many of whom came from Brooklyn. Somebody used to tell me, uh, told me a joke one time that if you called up the ACLU with a First Amendment case and you got someone with a Brooklyn accent on the phone, uh, you knew you were in good hands. But... <laughs> <laughs> which, which, when I started to think about those at the NYCLU and uh, at the National ACLU, I was like, "Yeah, you're probably right, actually." <laughs> at least back in the day. But uh, this is a generation that's 
retiring from the barricades. Um, right. right. This, I, when I was interviewing Norman Siegel for the same documentary that you're appearing in, he made this gesture. He said, if I could define what I do, it w- would be neutral principles. If I had any tattoo, it would, it would be across my chest and it would say neutral principles. Right. Uh, and that to me defines what it means to be an old school civil libertarian. But that generation and the events in America that led that generation to believe what it believed, namely the civil rights movement, uh, for many of them, the Vietnam anti-war movement, uh, again, retiring from the barricades or in the case of people like Nat Hentoff or Norman Dorson are quickly fading. That's what inspired me to make the film that's ostensibly about Ira Glasser and his life and career, but is more about what it means to be a civil libertarian. Uh, And I worry that my generation doesn't value the same principles or doesn't know the history well enough to value the same principles. I wonder if you have that fear as well. I share the fear, um, although it's maybe not for the exact same reasons that you've articulated. It has less to do with the history and more to do with the fact that everything has become so polarized and politicized Yeah, that um, it's almost as though there's something wrong with you if you do not back the cause perfectly in whatever cause it is. And the idea of neutral principles, of course, and the commitment to neutral principles is a commitment to stand to one side and say, look, there's this principle that applies to everybody and not just to my friends and the people that I agree with. And right now, Um, American democracy is foundering because that seems to be gone everywhere. And I mean, I, for the first time in my life, I fear not just for the loss of notions about neutral principles, but about um, whether we're going to be able to have a democracy in the way that we have always assumed we had, you know, whether the institutions are going to be able to withstand this polarization and this refusal to say that there are rules that apply to everybody and not just to my friends. Well, you see that in Congress too. I call it the politics of expediency, right? Uh, erasing norms, eliminating filibusters, talking about stacking the Supreme court, all right. as ways to, reach a short-term political goal without fear of the consequences long-term, which is exactly the sort of neutral principles that that civil libertarians stand to uphold. The idea being, of course, that if you give in to short-term political expediency, then this larger principle, which is more important, will be lost and it's harder to get back. Yeah, it seems to me there, absolutely, there's no reason that you cannot be either a progressive member of the Democratic Party or a, um, a member of the Tea Party, if you will, or whatever they call themselves at this point in time, and still also adhere to the notion that there are neutral principles that apply to everybody, even to me, and even when I don't like the consequences. Uh, and that's, that's being lost. Last question for you here. When you reflect on your career, which was you know, many decades, what is the one thing that you're most proud of? Would it be the Skokie case? Yes. I'm, in terms of what I did, um, yes, that was something that I am very proud of. It, it, to ask the question or answer the question a different way is, you know, I am proud that I've been able to stand up for neutral principles and fairness, basic fairness, which is what I think neutral principles means. And, um, and I hope that that's not lost in the next generations. Well, David, it's been a pleasure having you on the show, and hopefully I can have you on again sometime soon. All right. I appreciate the invitation. That was David Goldberg. You can learn more about him and the Skokie case in the forthcoming documentary, Mighty Ira, which is due out on October 9th via Angelica Film Centers. This podcast is hosted, produced, and recorded by me, Nico Perino, and edited by Aaron Reese. To learn more about So To Speak, you can follow us on Twitter at twitter.com slash freespeechtalk, or like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash so to speak podcast. You can also email us feedback at so to speak at the fire.org. 
If you enjoyed this episode, please consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts or Google Play. They do help us attract new listeners to the show. And until next time, thank you again for listening.